What is man that thou art mindful of him? Now, when we look at that word mindful, for many years, at least I did, I'd say, well, mindful means he, he takes notice of us. He's, he, he hasn't forgotten us. But that's not what it means in the Hebrew. Let me give you a little Bible lesson. When the Scripture says, 8 and 4 of Psalms, what is man that thou art mindful of him? You know what it says in the original? What is man that thy mind is full of him? No wonder David was such a great praiser and a great worshiper because he believed God thought about him all the time. If you and I were convinced that we were on God's mind every day, every moment, we'd be very careful about sinning. We'd be real careful about being discouraged and sucking our thumb and wanting to shoot ourselves in the foot. Let me ask you something. If you knew what I'm telling you, that you're on God's mind right now, what would you attempt? What would some of us do tonight if we were sure God would come to our rescue? What great exploit would we try for the Lord Jesus Christ if we were positive that God would intervene? He's thinking about you right now. You don't know what's coming up tomorrow, but he's already in tomorrow. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. He's got a destiny. He's waiting for you to respond to him. He doesn't run out of patience. He loves you with an everlasting love. There's never going to be a day when God doesn't love you. Jeremiah 31 said, Thou hast loved me with an everlasting love. Why? Because God is love and God is everlasting. So he loves you with himself. He can't stop loving you. It's one of his deals. He loves you right now. Well, I'm not a good person. That's okay. Nobody's a good person. All have sinned to come short of the glory of God. But God loves us like we are because he has the power to make us become what he wants us to be. Mindful. Perhaps this dictionary says mindful, to be aware of, to consider, to observe, to look at carefully, to think about, to ponder over. Just 30 seconds. Let's take a commercial break. Right now, God is pondering over you. Knows how you're hurting. Knows how close you are to giving in a temptation. Knows how lonely you are, how frustrated you are. Your nerves are being frazzled. He's pondering. You see, the Lord thinks on us. He's more interested in your soul than he is the stars. He's more interested in people than he is planets. God, who is glorious in power, who's majestic, who's awesome, who's all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful, who created all things, who causes for seasons and the regulation of the animal kingdom, whose ways are past finding out, who dwells in the light that no man can approach, who himself is light and life and truth, who has no beginning and who has no ending, yet that being thinks about me. See, the wonderful thing about this is we are unequally yoked. We really are. We are unequally yoked. He's pure and I'm unpure. He's holy and I'm unholy. He's good and I'm evil. He's kind and I'm wretched. But he yokes up with me and says, walk with me and I'll teach you my ways. And you'll learn. And you'll learn by association. And you'll learn by assimilation. And we keep walking with him. Listen, the purpose of being saved is not just to be saved. It's so that we become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We are are in a journey that we become like him you just read Psalms 90 verses 1 2 and 3 it says before the world was made before ever thou brought us forth the rivers and the oceans and the mountains thou hast been our dwelling place you see we came out of the heart and mind of God and God put us in this little cubicle this parenthesis called time but we were his before time. Watch. When Adam sinned, God lost what was his in time. And if he does, oh God, if he doesn't correct the mistake in time, they're going to be sentenced from time into eternal damnation because of the trespass. That's why, Brother Holden, that's why the Bible says 1 Peter 2.25. I've read that scripture at least a thousand times, I know. It says, and now 
you have returned unto the bishop of your soul. I read that for years and years and years, and I said, I never understand that. He's writing that to Gentiles who've been converted to the church. And yet he says, you have returned to the bishop of your souls. They never knew God before. Oh, he says, oh no, they were in God before time. Oh yes, if you read the scripture in Ephesians, he said he called us and chose us in him before the foundation of the world. We were already in the heart and mind and purpose of God before the world was ever made. And then when he put us in time, he lost his treasure, his kids, if you please. Don't you understand what salvation really is? What this is all about? It's about God going on soul patrol, trying to step into time to find his stuff that he lost that was his before time. He stepped from eternity into time. Was born of the Virgin Mary, stepped out of her body, and walked for 33 plus years in time to do one thing, what he said here about Zacchaeus. I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. You know what he did? While he was in time, he brought what was timeless, his spirit, and he put eternity into you. So now you have what he lives in, eternity, timelessness in you. You had the Bible says we are now the sons of God. We have eternal life now. And if you got the Holy Ghost when time is no more. You'll just walk right out of the sentence into glory. And you have returned to the bishop of your soul. That's why the Lord told those three parables in Luke 15. If you read Luke 15, verses 1 and 2, it said, Then the Pharisees and the scribes murmured against Jesus. They complained because of the riffraff he ran with. You ought to thank God he runs with riffraff. Where would we be? Where would we be if he only ran with the pure and the good? I ain't never found the pure and the good. The only pure and good people you ever find is dead ones in the grave. Uh-huh. And so he said, so he spake this parable unto him. The parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost sheep, and the parable of the lost particle means expenditure in extravagance, wasteful, overboard spending, generosity without rule. The story's not about the prodigal son. The story's about the prodigal father. Because when he got his boy home, he acted prodigal. He gave him the best robe. He gave him the family ring. He gave him the slippers for his feet. He killed the fatted calf. He struck up the band. He gave everybody a day off. He said, let's have a party. Don't you ever think that all the time that his boy was out whoremongering and honky-tonking and living with pigs, that he wasn't on daddy's mind? What is man that thou art mindful of him? Here's the one that kills me. That thou visitest him. God visiting people. The king visiting slaves. The master visiting pawns. Visit. Now it's impressive when the neighbor comes over and says, Hi, I just heard you were sick, heard your mom wasn't doing well, I just want to pay you a visit. Well, that was awful kind. It's more powerful when a relative comes 2,000 miles and knocks on the door and you say, Aunt Myrtle, Uncle Joe, what, what are you doing here? Well, I was praying and the Lord told me you're hurting and you're discouraged and I just want to pay you a visit. Think about how far he came to pay this planet a visit. What is the distance from God to man? How far did God come to find you? 